Amen, my brother. Hallelujah. Thanks, Jesus. It could be just about any time. Amen. He is coming. He is coming. He is coming. Revelation chapter 4. He's coming. We're going to meet him in the air. Amen. Revelation chapter number 19. He is coming. He will arrive on earth. He is coming. He is coming. It was prophesied. It was promised. It is sure. It is true. We will see Jesus. Amen. We will see Jesus. Revelation. We're going to jump in here just for a moment or two in Revelation chapter number 19. And we are going to move into Revelation chapter number 20 as we are continuing our study uh, of eschatology through the book of Revelation, looking at Isaiah, looking at Ezekiel, looking at so many of the Old Testament prophecies, uh, looking at the words of Jesus, comparing Scripture with Scripture. I'm glad that God is not hiding the future of this world, but that He is very plainly, very openly revealing it to us through the passages of Scripture. And so we continue our study tonight. The definite second coming of Christ in glory. Revelation 19 and verse number 11. The definite second coming of Christ in glory. I'm entitling this sermon because they always want us title. Here comes the judge. Say that with me. Here comes the judge. Amen. He is definitely coming. The Bible says in verse number 11, I saw heaven open. John said, Behold a white horse, he that sat upon him was called faithful and true, and in righteousness he does judge and make war. The king is coming, and he is coming to judge. Notice his character, verse 11. He is faithful and he is true. Two titles that are attributed repeatedly to the Lord Jesus Christ throughout the New Testament. You will see his conduct. He is coming so that he may judge. You and I really are told that we should be careful how we judge. Uh, that we not judge one another, that we not judge things too harshly. Jesus is judge, and oh, by the way, Jesus is jury as well. Somebody say, Amen. And so, his conduct, he is coming to judge, and he is coming to make war. Obviously, we've talked a little bit about that. You will notice his clothing in verse number 13. He's clothed with a vesture dipped in blood. His clothing dipped in blood, representative of the fact, as we reviewed last week, that it, it, it speaks of his shedding the blood for our sins. Uh, so that we could be white and pure. He shed his blood and we are reminded of the blood that is upon his clothing, his communication. He is called the word of God. He himself said, I have come to reveal God unto you. I have come that you may know God. These things I speak from the Father unto you. And so he is called the Word of God. We see that phrase uh, when John wrote the gospel. In the beginning was what? The Word. And the Word was what? With God. And the Word was what? was God. He is the Word. He is, uh, he is, communicates to us the will of the Father. And we saw verse 14 as we looked last week, the armies which were in heaven followed upon him, uh, followed him upon white horses, clothed in fine linen, white and clean. But let us not overlook verse number 12, on his head were Many crowns, say that with me, many crowns. He is indeed Lord of lords and he is king of kings. And again, the king is coming. And so we see the definite second coming of Christ in glory. We see the deadly battle of Armageddon as we reviewed uh, the word of the Lord, the word of God. The Lord Jesus has come to judge and make war that is to put an end to the world's rebellion against God and against Israel, those 
people of God, the chosen people of God. We see, we have seen the doom of the beast, the doom of the false prophet, verse number 20, chapter number 19, the beast was taken, uh, the beast being the Antichrist, his whole uh, system of religion that he has established, he, his system of religion, the false prophet who promoted that system of religion, that false counterfeit uh, Christianity, if you will, they are taken and they are thrown. The Bible says, <clears throat> into the lake of fire that is burning with brimstone. And so we are reviewing the definite second coming of Christ in glory, 11 through 16. The deadly battle of Armageddon we see 17, 18, 19. The doom of the beast, the doom of the false prophet, verse number 20. And then the doom of the kings in verse number 21. These being the leadership of the world, the Gentile rulers of the world, when Christ returns, his actual second coming, his appearance upon the earth, all of those world leaders, all of those who lead the countries, who lead the people, who lead the armies in rebellion again against God and against God's people, the Bible says that they are slain. And all God's people said, victory belongs unto the Lord. And so we begin chapter number 20 tonight. We will see that chapter number 20 teaches us about the delight of, of the kingdom age we'll read together John writes and I saw an angel come down from heaven having the key to, of the bottomless pit and a great chain in his hand and he laid hold on the dragon that old serpent which is the devil and Satan and bound him for a thousand years and cast him into the bottomless pit and shut him up and set a seal upon him that he should deceive the nations no more till the thousand years should be fulfilled and after that he must be loosed for a season. Verse 1. Verse 2, verse 3, if we were to give that a heading tonight, we would, could call that the restraining of the serpent. The restraining of the serpent. First of all, he was restrained by a delegated person for a definite period in a dreadful place for a divine purpose. And here we go. You will notice with me that he is restrained by a delegated person. I saw an angel coming down from heaven having the key to the bottomless pit and a great chain in his hand. Whenever Paul wrote to the Romans, he wrote in chapter number 16, speaking unto the Romans, and yea, speaking unto us today, I would have you wise unto that which is good and simple concerning evil. <clears throat> And the God of peace shall bruise Satan under your feet shortly. Victory belongs to the Christian. It is assured by God. It is assured through Jesus Christ. It is assured and sure as he said it, he will do it. We see the restraining of the serpent by a delegated person or by a delegated representative. We can only speculate. The Bible says it's an angel. Now we can only speculate which angel it might have been. But in chapter number 12, if you'll remember we studied how that Satan and his followers were cast out of heaven and it was Michael the archangel who was there as if he was responsible uh, to make sure that they went out. Maybe it is uh, Michael, the angel that comes down from heaven with the key to the bottomless pit. The last time that we saw this key mentioned, you'll remember, Satan used it. He was permitted to open uh, this prison uh, and release swarms of those uh, foul fiends of all kind upon the face of the earth. And so he was allowed to do so. 
opened the bottomless pit. The bottomless pit is a place that we have studied before where demons are incarcerated. They are there pending their final sentencing to the lake of fire. There are uh, angels uh, 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 acting as demons today alongside of Lucifer, alongside of Satan, who are influencing the world who are deceiving Christians, who are uh, uh, in ways tormenting Christians, in ways trying to uh, 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 confuse Christians and, and to make a mess of Christianity, to tear churches apart, to ruin lives, even of Christians. That's why we must realize and we must pray that God would continually protect us. We know that there are certain angels that uh, were so vile We've talked about this in the past. Uh, perhaps those that were responsible uh, before the days of the flood to enticing men, enticing women to certain things. And we've talked about how uh, some of those angels uh, were, were put in, in the strictest of prison, uh, how that they are not even allowed uh, out amongst the earth uh, uh, to affect mankind. We studied about that when we were doing a, a study of the book of Genesis some time back. So the bottomless pit is a place where demons, fallen angels, are incarcerated pending their final sentencing to the lake of fire. And so we see an angel, perhaps Michael. He has the keys to the bottomless pit. He has a great chain in his hand. And so the Bible says... He laid hold of the dragon. Verse number two, we find he's called that serpent of old. We find he is called the devil. We find that he is called Satan. Four of the titles of God's most ancient foe are used in this one sentence. But we see that for a definite period, a definite period of a thousand years, the cruel, cunning one, the one skilled in deception, the crafty, the shrewd, the sharp deceiver of men. The Bible says that this angel laid hold on him, not only Satan, but those demons as well that serve him. All of this is taking place. Their imprisonment, therefore, will drastically, dramatically, as we study, alter the world during the kingdom, which is the millennial kingdom, since their destructive influence... In all areas of human thought, all areas of life is going to be removed. And so we are going to tonight talk about the promise of the millennial kingdom. An angel, perhaps it's Michael, he now has the keys to the bottomless pit. He has a shade. He lays hold of Satan, binds him with the chains, and he throws him in the bottomless pit bottomless pit. You need to understand that the power of language that is being used here emphasizes doubly, emphasizes in two ways, the powerlessness of Satan to stop and prevent the will of God. The chains, I don't know if you've ever been in chains or shackles. If you have, I may not want to know about it. But I'm telling you, Chains are meant to keep you as a prisoner from doing what you would like to do as a free person. So he is chained, he is shackled. And not only that, he is thrown into the bottomless pit, which is the most secure prison there's ever been made. Alcatraz, escapable. Licking jail, Escapable. Look, well, you don't have a jail. Texas County Jail, escapable. This prison out here, we like to think that it is inescapable, but I'm telling you what, somebody, somehow, some way could escape that prison. I'm just telling you, not to scare you, but just to let you know there, Houdini could get out. Somebody with me tonight? Houdini could get out of anything. And Satan, with all his cunningness, with all his craftiness, he will not devise a way to escape when the angel lays hold on him, puts chains on him, and casts him into the lake of fire. The dragon, the word dragon, 
liking Satan to a dragon, he emphasizes his ferocity, his cruelty, the serpent of old. I believe that simply is making a reference to Satan's first appearance in the Garden of Eden where he deceived Eve and then he deceived Adam. So the Bible says that the angel bound him. I may have said last week, it's a bit of poetic justice, really. Satan sealed the mortal remains of God's beloved son in the tomb. He thought he was done with him. Christ arose. He could not be prevented. He arose, he arose, he arose. Hallelujah, Christ arose. Stone was rolled away. Nothing prevented Christ. However, we see that now the devil is cast into the most secure prison that's ever been established. His power to influence the nations is suppressed. He will not be able to tempt mankind. He will not be present during the thousand years. You understand? Are you with me tonight? Now understand this. Generations are born during this millennial kingdom while Satan is bound. And earth flourishes, I believe, when you properly understand the millennial kingdom. The earth itself, the earth flourishes. The curse of sin removed from the earth. Uh, I don't believe we'll have to worry about briars and thorns uh, uh, overtaking gardens. I just think there will be plentiful floods will not wash away the sea. Will not, uh, fires will not destroy the harvest, you understand? It will be as it was in the Garden of Eden to all of its glory for a thousand years. <clears throat> and generations are born. And earth flourishes during this time as it did in Eden before Satan seduced mankind to sin for a thousand years. If you got the picture with me tonight. All right? Uh, Y'all gonna have to listen fast because I'm gonna speak fast. Amen, because we're going to get through some stuff tonight for a thousand years. By the way, this is the first of six references to the length of the millennial kingdom. Notice verse 3, verse 4, verse 5, verse 6, verse 7. We make, he makes sure that we understand this thousand years. Uh, so, for a definite period, by a delegated person... Satan is bound. Satan is in prison in a dreadful place, the bottomless pit. Where is the bottomless pit? Well, if you study Scripture in its entirety, it certainly seems that Scripture would tend to teach us that it's located somewhere beneath the earth. Somewhere beneath the earth. When Satan is allowed to unlock this prison and those, no, those demons and, the, and those, 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 those wicked, vile creatures come out of there to infect the earth. And so it stands to me, and I've always heard it preached, and I don't have any way to dispute it. It's the truth. I do believe that it would be located in the center somewhere of the earth. The core of the earth is so, so hot. And we could preach a sermon and a sermon and a sermon and a sermon on that. Uh, it seems to be located beneath the earth. The opening is referred to twice in Revelation here. And the other one that I've made mention of is chapter 9 and verse number 1. There we see in that verse, chapter 9 verse 1, a star that fell from heaven to earth. We're speaking of the evil angels, their expulsion from heaven. The star was given the keys to the bottomless pit. It was given by a grant from God. Now we see the keys to the bottomless pit are in control of God's angel. And God is in control. So God grants Satan a limited amount of power. But he could shut him down any time. He could shut him down any time. Right now, Brother Lonnie, God may grant Satan a limited amount of power to try to influence you and to try to torment you, to try to discourage you, to try to confuse you. The Bible teaches us that the devil himself is going before God now and he's accusing each and every one of us. You remember he accused Job? 
And what did the devil, uh, what did God do? He allowed the devil a certain amount of rain against Job. But he can be stopped at any time. God can remove the thorn in our flesh, being Satan, from persecuting us. If you believe that, then you're right in believing that. Okay? The bottomless pit, all seven times that this appears in the book of Revelation, it refers to the place where those fallen angels and evil spirits are kept captive, again waiting to be sent to the lake of fire, which is the, the final hell that was prepared for them. Hell was not prepared for man. Hell was not prepared for the souls of men and women. It was repaired, it was prepared, it was created for Satan and those fallen angels that chose to rebel against God under the leadership of Lucifer. You understand? For a divine purpose, he is in a dreadful place for a definite period, placed there by a delegated person for a divine purpose. The Bible says, so that he should deceive the nations no more. I'm not saying, I'm not saying, I do not believe that the Bible clearly teaches that there will be absolutely no sin on earth during the thousand year millennial kingdom. But I'm going to tell you this, it will be sin of the flesh of man. It will not be because of the temptation of Satan. It will not be because of the influence of Satan. If there is any commit, if there is any sin committed, it's going to be because it's the will of man without interference from Satan. Amen. It's going to be perfect paradise. The world restored as it should be, as it was meant to be. And so, as we move on, <clears throat> And I, and I saw thrones, verse 4, and they that sat upon them, and judgment was given to them. And I saw the souls of them that were beheaded for the witness of Jesus and for the word of God, and which had not worshipped the beast, neither his image, neither had received his mark upon their foreheads or in their hands, and they lived and reigned with Christ a thousand years. But the rest of the dead lived not again until the thousand years were finished. This is the first resurrection. Blessed and holy is he that hath part in the first resurrection. On such the second death hath no power, but they shall be priests of God and of Christ, and shall reign with him for a thousand years. And so we see that during that time, during that thousand years, we, <clears throat> the rule of the Savior, and, and those whom He delegates to rule with Him, will take place. Verse 4, 5, and 6, if you were to put a heading there, you could call it the rule of the Savior. We've read verse number 4. Tribulation saints are resurrected. Verse number 6, triumphant saints are rejoicing. Notice verse number 4, the souls of them that were beheaded. Why, why are the tribulation saints beheaded? For the witness of Jesus. For the word of God, number 2. And for not worshiping the beast that is refusing to take his mark. And so those martyred, those tribulation saints... We see they too have been resurrected and they too will have their place in the kingdom. 1 Corinthians 6 and 2, Paul writes, <clears throat> Do you not know that the saints shall judge the world? You ever get any thought to that passage of Scripture? He goes on to say in verse 3, Know ye not that we shall judge angels? There is coming a time when saints will judge. That means we will rule 
along with Christ. Paul wrote, Timothy, if we suffer, we shall also reign with him. If we deny him, he will also deny us. And so those of us who choose Christ, we expect that along the way, Satan will cause suffering, Satan will bring persecution, but we will be rewarded in the end. If we deny Christ, then we'll have no part of Christ's kingdom, and Father will deny us because we have denied Jesus Christ. So when the Lord returns, I believe the passage is teaching us that He is going to, I don't know, dispose, depose two different types of ruling class. In other words, He's going to dethrone those. <clears throat> Closing of chapter number 19, He has dethroned the leadership of the world. We read that, didn't we? He is dethroning them, defrocking them, whatever words you want to use. They will no longer rule because He has eliminated them. And in their place, others will rule. He is going to, according to Isaiah 24, 21, if you would like to write it down, Isaiah prophesies He will punish the host of the high ones that are on high. That prophecy is directly, I believe, connected to the prophecy of Revelation chapter number 19 where in, 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 in judging the world, word of his mouth, the Lord returning eliminates those who have not faith in him, those places of leadership. You know, the Satan's people, his princes on his thrones, different passages confirm that. I'm not going to take time to read all these. Colossians 1 and 16, I, thought, I think speaks to this. I really think that Ephesians 6 and 13 really speaks to some of what's going on here. You study them for yourself. So, when those leaders are removed, I think Scripture is teaching us that these thrones in the heavenlies will be occupied throughout the millennium by the triumphant believers of the church age, by the tribulation saints that are being resurrected. There's a place for us, along with the high ones, will be deposed, be thrown, the kings of the earth. And so the, angel, the, the, the evil angels, they will no longer have their way, the Most High. They will no longer have their way. They will no longer usurp their will over saints. The leadership of the world, the world leaders, the Gentile world leaders, the lost, the Gentile rulers of the earth, the kings of the earth will be removed. And I believe, according to Isaiah 60 and 12, I can, I can, see, I can, I can see this here. I believe that there will be a special place for the redeemed of Israel. According to Isaiah, they will take over their seats of authority, these world leaders. I believe that those places of authority will be given to the redeemed of Israel. And I believe if you properly understand Scripture, the twelve apostles, according to Matthew 19 and 28, will be there to tutor them, instruct them. The twelve apostles, the eleven Judas, a traitor. Judas, not included in the ranks of the apostles after the resurrection of Christ. And God put in place the apostle Paul. And there's 12. Paul being a Jew. Amen. And so when you compare scripture to scripture, the Bible reveals so much about the future of mankind here upon the face of the earth. Tribulation saints are resurrected. They rule with the Savior. The triumphant saints are rejoicing in verse number 6. Their state is described as happy. Their standing is said to be holy. It is the first resurrection. Uh, verse number 5, the first resurrection. Scripture teaches two kinds of resurrection. The resurrection of life. <clears throat> the resurrection of condemnation. I think Daniel mentions, I think Daniel's talking that in Daniel 12 and 2, if you want to tie it all together. John also, the book of Acts. The first kind of resurrection is described as the resurrection of the just, the resurrection of those who are Christ at His coming, 1 Corinthians 15, 23. 
and the better resurrection. That's the resurrection of the life. It includes the redeemed of the church age, the Old Testament saints, the tribulation saints. They will enter the kingdom in resurrection bodies along with believers who survived the tribulation. I've told you this in many ways before we got to this point. But understand this, as we probably will close tonight. During the thousand year reign upon this earth, those, Revelation 19, those armies, the king is coming, we're coming with him. It includes the Old Testament saints. <clears throat> Even before the law was given, we've studied how Abraham had faith in God and his faith was counted to him for righteousness. Adam still had faith in God after the expulsion from the garden. He had so much faith in God and he learned the lesson that it took the blood of goats and lambs to cover up his mistake that he taught his children to build an altar and make sacrifices unto God. Righteousness. Finding favor of God. Trusting God. Realizing a void. A void that demanded bloodshed. It's all through the Old Testament. The law eventually given to the Jews. The rest of the world came to God by coming through the Jewish nation by adhering to the laws, by, by becoming a part of the Jewish nation, grafted in. Right. All a reminder of the blood that was shed on our behalf. All the Old Testament saints, the lessons they learned, the typology is repeated over and over and over in the Old Testament. All of those things pointed to Christ. In the New Testament, shedding His blood, he shed His blood for all of the Old Testament saints. He shed His blood for all the New Testament saints. He shed His blood for all the tribulation saints. He shed His blood that sin may be blotted out. That one day we would know the resurrection of life. And we would not have to experience the resurrection of condemnation. And we'll talk about that later on. The resurrection of condemnation. The second kind of resurrection will be the resurrection of the unconverted who will receive their final bodies that will be suited for torments in hell. And we'll study that as we study the rest of this chapter. Verse number 6. Blessed, blessed and holy is he who has part in the first resurrection. Blessed those who die in the Lord are blessed with the privilege of entering his kingdom. Kingdom of God. The kingdom of God exists now. All who are Christians are part of the kingdom of God. All who are Christians, we are part of the kingdom of heaven. And we will take part in the kingdom of heaven when it is set up during the millennial kingdom. Verse number 6 speaks of the second death. Over such, the second death has no power. The second death... The first death is spiritual and physical. The second death is the eternal lake of fire, the eternal hell. It could exist outside the created universe as we know it, outside the, the space of time. It could be presently uh, in existence anywhere. I've always heard preachers say it's probably the center of the earth. Who knows where hell is, but it's a prepared place for a people that reject God and ultimately reject Jesus Christ. We'll study next week the resurrection of those who died rejecting the grace the mercy of God. I hope that you picked up something tonight as we have very quickly looked over most of this chapter. We see that when the king comes he comes in all of his glory. Saints come with him of all ages. 
The angel then restrains the serpent. During that time, heaven and uh, earth is as it was meant to be in that be heaven on earth. I mean, listen, literally, Satan will have no influence over the earth. Next week, we'll get in and we'll see the release of the serpent and what takes place after that. And that's a lesson for another day as we will finish out this chapter next time.